the home downsizing process, how to deal with their collectibles and their antiques and the general household. And Phil will explain why many of the things you own may be worth much less than you thought. <laughs> <laughs> but don't despair, because it will also reveal categories that are probably worth more than you expected. And I'll wrap up things with 25 things you can throw away the minute you return home. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, guys, I'm stunned. I really am. I was here last year, and we did an Antiques Roadshow event, and those usually fill up, and not nearly crowded. we got today, so thanks for coming out. Uh, what she says is true. What we're going to talk about today is i got a PowerPoint presentation where we're going to talk about 25 categories that will probably disappoint you uh, when you go to sell. And you're not going to have all 25 of them, but I'll bet you each one of you have a good four, five, six, seven, or eight of them. Uh, then we'll talk about what's hot. You may like it, you may not like it, but the world has changed. Take a look at the average age around this room. We've got older. Show of hands. How many of your kids want your stuff? It's like that wherever we speak, so uh, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. And then uh, we'll wrap it up with 25 things that you could probably trash the minute you get home. Fair enough? Um, my wife is here somewhere. I want to acknowledge her, but I think she's out getting some more brochures because we brought in about 20 brochures. Uh, anyway, I do wear a lot of different hats. Um, I'm an appraiser. I help people understand the value of what they own. I'm an auctioneer. Uh, Trish Mixon from Mixon Insurance used to come to our auctions up in Pennsylvania, Vermont, New Hampshire, wherever we were. Uh, and I specialize in something called Wallace Nutting, hand-colored photographs. Uh, we ran, my wife and I ran nutting auctions for 30 years. And that market has just tailed off because all my clients got older and they stopped collecting and their kids don't want the stuff. So, but we're still uh, auctioneers. But you put those two things together, what I found is there's a whole bunch of us that have a house full of stuff. Either you've downsized to Holmes Beach, Anna Marie Island, or you're thinking about it, or whatever, but you don't know what to do with stuff. So that's where I became a downsizing specialist. I wrote a book called Home Downsizing and Four Easy Steps. I kind of just traded my hat in from being the auctioneer that you knew me as. Although I can still talk fast if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> and to helping people deal with their stuff. Uh, back home, we charge $195 to go out to a house. And we do basically two things. We help people understand what their stuff is worth and what their options are. And sometimes we give good news. And we've gotten pretty good at giving bad news, too. So uh, that's kind of what we do. Uh, and then... We're going on our sixth year now. I have a Philadelphia radio show in Philadelphia called What's It Worth? Ask Mike the Appraiser. And that's what the whole thing is. Tomorrow we're talking about selling real estate at auction. Uh, in two weeks, I've got Gimme Jimmy, from the, who's the president of the, the Vintage Tablecloth Collector Club. We're talking vintage tablecloths. So each week we talk something different. So uh, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about value. What is your stuff worth? And if you were to hire me to come out to your house, the first question I ask you has three parts. And you can't say all three parts. No. I'll say you think about the stuff you want to sell. Are you looking for the most amount of money? You want to do the least amount of work, or you have to get rid of it in the shortest amount of time. You can't say all three. Most money, least work, shortest amount of time. Worst position is shortest amount of time. So you're here, you're thinking about it. Obviously, if it was a nicer day, happy probably would be on the beach, but uh, <laughs> that's what it is. Uh, but you're thinking ahead. And I'll tell you right now, if you're going to be downsizing your homes at some point, it's going to take you a good six months to a year to downsize if you want to get fair market value. Worst position I ever saw. A woman called me up on a Thursday saying, Mike, I'll be out of my house on Saturday. What do I do? And yeah, and that's, a, that's the answer because it was, oh, she was by herself. She had no kids. Her husband had passed. And she had a house full of memories. And she couldn't deal with it. And we had to dump more than we probably should have. Now, most people say, well, of course, Mike, I want the most amount of money. And I say, if you want the most amount of money, you've got to be willing and able to do the most amount of work. You've got to polish it, clean it, repair it. You've got to take it to the local flea market and stand outside all day, garage sale, four, five, six weekends until it's gone. You have to put it on eBay, pack it, ship it. You've got to put it on Craigslist and have strangers coming into your home. And Trish just gave me that look. <laughs> Nobody wants strangers coming into their house. So if you're not willing to do that, then you know the options with the least amount of work are varied. Now, if you're selling, it means you no longer want it or you can't keep it. You've already shown me unanimously your kids don't want the stuff. So one option is auction, okay? Auctions are different. They're not working the way they used to. The markets change, but the auction might be one option. I'll come back to that. 
Uh, we all think that we're going to find someone who loves our treasures the way we did. They're going to pay us top retail dollar. Not going to happen. I guarantee you that's not going to happen. You will most likely get a wholesale price. I'll come back to that. You don't want it. Your kids don't want it. The auctioneer doesn't want it. You can't find a buyer. Sometimes the easiest thing is just to donate it, be done with it, take a small tax write off, and find a new home for it. And then, if they don't want it for free, that's when you put it out by the curb with a free sign on it, or you call 1 800 got junk, or something like that. Uh, let's talk about auctions a little bit, because I'm an auctioneer. Uh, I sold Wall of Stunnings, Fred Thompson's, hand colored photographs, Maxfield Parish prints, things like that for years. But whether it's an auctioneer here or an auctioneer in Pennsylvania or anywhere else, three things are going to happen when you can sign to auction. Now, one, they're going to charge you a commission, bigger 25 to 35% on average. Secondly, that commission doesn't include a pickup fee. So if you're dealing in prints, uh, jewelry, coins, you can drive the stuff to the auctioneer and drop it off. But if you're downsizing from a house that's got four bedrooms full of furniture and you can only take enough to fill one bedroom, mm -hmm. then by the time you pay that 35% commission and moving fee, there's no money left. And auctioneers don't want to do business with someone where you end up owing the auctioneer money. It's bad business because they're even a bad mouth. <laughs> Uh, but most importantly at auctions, they're going to sell things at what's called absolute auction. That means no minimums, no reserves. It's going to bring whatever it brings. And for a lot of stuff, it's not a good time to be selling it. You know, think back 30 years ago. We're all 30 years younger. We're all working, making more money. Uh, and theoretically, we're all competing against each other at auctions. And we bid the price of this stuff up with two thoughts in mind. Number one, we thought the older it got it, the got more valuable it would become. And we also thought the next generation would like it as much as we did. And neither one of those things has happened. So prices on a lot of the stuff has been tumbling down. So that's the first question I'm gonna ask you. Most money, least amount of work, shortest amount of time. How you answer that is gonna probably determine what you're gonna get. Let me throw out three terms to you, three words. They sound like they're the same thing, but there's gonna be one very important difference. Price, cost, value. Price, cost, value. If you go to an antique store or an antique shop and you see a cut glass bowl that's priced at $250, that price is a fact. You say to the dealer, yes, ma'am, I know you're asking $250, I'll give you buck seventy-five right now. <laughs> you say, okay, I'll take your $175. My price, my cost is a fact at $175. I get it home, what's the value? Value is not a fact. Value is not $175. Value is whatever you can get for it. Now there's a huge difference between a retail transaction and an auction transaction. Now, uh, let's take this cut glass bowl. I've got it priced at $250. And this guy comes in, he says, I know my wife will like that cut glass bowl. I'll give you $175. Uh, I've got three choices, or he's got three choices. He pays my price of $250, makes me a counter offer, and walks out the door. Either way, I control the selling situation, right? The minute I give it to the auctioneer, I've lost control of the selling situation and market takes over. 30 years ago, he and I might have been willing to pay $250 for that bowl. But now, probably neither one of us will pay that kind of money. But if he's willing to pay $250, and I say to myself, I think I can flip that for $50 at the flea market tomorrow, I'll pay $25 and no more. He's willing to pay $250, I'm willing to pay $25, and no one else in this room wants it that day. What does he have to pay to get it? 25 plus one bid, exactly. So that's how things work. So certain things, if they're hot commodities, if they're highly desirable, it pays to sell that stuff at auction. Uh, if it's not so hot, probably it's best to hang on to the best you can. Uh, as an appraiser, I do three types of appraisals. The most common is insurance replacement cost. The insurance agent right here will tell you if your house burns down and you have a million dollars worth of art, you're not covered for a million dollars unless you have it scheduled on an endorsement or a private rider. Most HO3s, which are homeowners insurance, and HO6s, which I guess are condo, whatever, they limit you to some of this stuff. So unless you have an insurance replacement cost appraisal, you're not going to be covered for it. And the de definition of insurance replacement cost is what's the most it's going to cost you to replace it if it was lost, damaged, destroyed, or stolen. That number's up here. You're going to pay extra premium-wise, but you're, you've got the coverage. If you were to pass away, if you were to get divorced, if you were to donate it to the library or someplace else and you wanted to take a tax write-off, I would have to do what's called a fair market value appraisal. 
That's different than insurance replacement costs. Insurance replacement costs, what's the most that's gonna cost you to replace it? Fair market value is what's a reasonable price between a willing buyer, willing <laughs> seller. We both know what we're doing, no one's getting snookered, okay? But for most of the things you're looking to sell, you're not looking for either one of those numbers. You're looking for the liquidation value, right? Liquidation value is what can I get sell, what can I sell something for fairly quickly? And that number is, is fairly uncertain. So that's just a quick primer on <laughs> values and things like that. Uh, let's see, make sure I have this looking right here. What we're going to talk about is 25 things that will probably disappoint you when it comes time to sell. Which way am I pressing this? Is this the right one? Yeah, it should be. Okay, how do I go back? Um, okay. We'll make, we'll make this work, that's fine. Okay, we're talking about 25 things that will probably disappoint you. Baseball cards. Now, we're not talking all baseball cards. If you got a T206 set, you got that Honus Wagner T206 from 1911, that tobacco card? That sold for as much as $3.2 million. If you have a 1952, this, you're, this is the age group where we all had Mickey Mantle's Ricky card at some point, 1952. Except some of you guys probably put it on your bicycles with clothespins <laughs> to take a bicycle and a motorcycle. Okay, we ruined our cards, but a 1952 Mantle Ricky card has sold for $3.2 million. I mean, the good stuff really sells. But back during the 80s and 90s, cards, cards have value up to maybe the mid 60s, early 70s, late 70s. Then after that, you can almost sell them by the pound. But what happened is every dad in the country went out and started collecting baseball cards with his son or daughter. And they would go out and buy a whole year, keep them in the box, and they say, we're not going to touch these. We're going to hold them for 20 years. And this is how we're going to pay for your college education. <laughs> right? Yeah. Every guy did that. So now all those cards are coming out, and they're a dime a dozen. Auctioneers are selling boxes by the year. Ten, and by ten, ten, five, and two and a half, two and a half, and two and a half, and another year in. That's how they're selling cards. So you're probably going to be disappointed when you come to those cards. Now, there's an exception to everything I say. If you have, I think it's a 1995 or 1996 uh, Jeter with the Yankee, Derek Jeter, rookie card. That thing is sold for like $150,000. And it's a mint 10. I mean, it doesn't any better than that. But whoever's buying those things is speculating that Derek Jeter's rookie card is going to go up. Is it going to bring that kind of money? I can't imagine that. But baseball cards. Early cards have a lot of value. You'll be disappointed when you go to sell later cards. Okay. Collector plates. Every year I used to buy my mother collector plates. I buy her B and G, Yule after collector plates, blue and white. Start paying thirty dollars, forty, fifty, sixty. She loved it. Okay. They're only going to up in value, right? You can have any kind of collector plates from John Wayne, Shirley Temple, B and G, whatever. Everybody jumped on bandwagon. Danbury Mint, uh, all these other companies came out with these plates. Franklin Mint was horrible. Yeah, they all they all the same. The Bradford Exchange. You ever, you ever heard of Bradford Exchange? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what the concept was there? They were creating a stock exchange for plates. That's what the Bradford Exchange was. So you would buy their plate at $79, $89, and if that plate only goes up 10% a year, after 20 years, your $69.95 investment is going to be worth $14,000. They literally had pieces of paper like this encouraging you to buy the stuff. There were some baseball cards today. They'll put original box, original authenticity, certificate of authenticity, stack. Hang, hang, high, and do it, do it, have to, have to. Nobody wants it. Kids don't want the stuff today. So collect your plates, you will probably be disappointed. Who is the one upper, up, my upper left, okay. On the radio show, a number of years ago, we brought in my grandkids. They were 10 and 12 at the time, and we did a segment of the radio show called Future Young Collectors. And I said to them, who's Justin Bieber? 
Where's Taylor Swift? Who's Justin Timberlake? They knew, they knew, they knew. I said, who's Shirley Temple? I don't know. Who's John Wayne? Bing, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, all these, they didn't know. And my point to my listeners was we all collect what we grew up with. These kids didn't grow up with Shirley Temple. Value of Shirley Temple's going down, in my opinion. Dion Quintuplets, down. Nobody knows them except people our age. But people invested in that kind of stuff for years. Okay, almost anything with the name mint in it. <laughs> Franklin, Danbury mint. My pet peeve is the New York mint. You ever heard this commercial? The New York Mint has just discovered a brand new hoard of brilliant uncirculated silver dollars. Oh, and they're, we're selling people for only $49.95. We guarantee that they're going to be graded between good and brilliant uncirculated. Any coin collectors here? If you were a coin collector, you would know that if, if it's graded good, you can barely read the date. Uh, it's so worn <laughs> off. So what do you think you're going to get for your $49.95? A brilliant uncirculated coin or something in good condition that you can barely read it? So they're going to sell you, you're looking at the five or ten, hmm. <laughs> $50, or $50 a piece, and you're getting a $10 coin. So you got to be wary of anything with the mint in it, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. 56 villages. <laughs> <laughs> There's an exception to everything. If you have the twin trade towers, 500 to 1,000 bucks. If you have the Empire State Building, 500 to 1,000 dollars. But most of us don't have those. We have the little. 50 in the boxes. Virtual boxes, it doesn't matter. The kids don't want the stuff. I've been in houses where they've had 200, 300 of these things. Not much value in those guys. Okay. Your holiday collectibles may mean a lot to you. They probably don't mean much to anybody else. What I look for is that if I see a zip code on the box, if I see a uh, barcode, if it says two guys, four guys, five guys is the hamburger place, but you want two guys up in, up in New Jersey used to be a department store, Jane Kmart, Walmart. They're your, they're your Christmas memories. Sell them at a garage sale or donate them because the auctioneer doesn't want them. If you have early turn of the century, those are paper mache pumpkins from Halloween and early Christmas bulbs and lights, they can be collectible, but anything from the 60s on, is not old, just let it go. Now I should probably take this next slide out. <laughs> because the world's changed. <laughs> vinyl's hot today. Vinyl is hot. Now not all vinyl is hot, but uh, I just had uh, a woman from uh, Maryland on my radio show last week talking about vinyl records. Some vinyl is hot, okay, why? I don't know. I can't tell the difference. I tell people, I don't know if it's my 69-year-old hearing or what, the kids say, oh man, can't you tell the superior sound from that man? I can't tell the difference. Uh, but 33 sell, uh, but not all of them. If you have early rock, you know, some of the 60s rock with good graphics, a lot of people are buying the record just for the album covers, framing them and putting them on their walls. I mean, that's cool. I just saw where a, um, a 78 record, jazz, from somebody I never heard of, sold for $19,000 on eBay, okay? But it was something you, that's the only place you're gonna get is in the record. A lot of these things were not converted to CDs. What about glass records? Glass records? Who's the buy? Okay, here, let's, let's, well, I'm gonna give you the test right now. When was the last time you listened to it? Never. <laughs> that's kind of really what you gotta look at. Who's gonna want it? I mean, I've gone into houses where people say, hey, I got some really old thick records downstairs of John Philip Sousa records. Who listens to that stuff anymore? <laughs> Here, 15,000 songs the kids hold on these things. I mean, so, so that's where it's at. So vinyl, they're saying it's hot. If you have jazz, early blues, good rock, you might make some money on your records. I'm sorry? Depends. Depends how hot that person is. That's got to get more specific than that. But if you're sitting on polka albums, <laughs> classical albums, Don Ho, Hawaiian albums, you're not going to make any money on those six guys. Now, we're laughing. This, this presentation.
Cash has been changing over the last year. I mean, we used to laugh at people keeping eight tracks. What, what, what was one of the reasons eight tracks were invented? Because you couldn't play your vinyl records in your car. So when we were all teenagers, we got one of those screwed into the under, underside of the dashboard and play our eight tracks. And then eight tracks kind of went out and they came in with cassettes. Uh, my, my record guest last week says, Mike, cassettes are coming back. There's people buying them because they, they can't get any other thing. It doesn't mean, trust me, if you've got 100 cassettes in your basement, one or two of them might be worth five bucks. It's not like they're making big money. But uh, you're probably okay letting go of these tapes. Magazines. All right. What is the most widely kept magazine in American history? That'd be incorrect. Sports Illustrated. That'd be incorrect. Playboy. Who said Playboy? <laughs> She's right. Guys never threw their Playboys away. Never. If you have a first edition 1954 Playboy with Marilyn Monroe in the centerfold, never read? Ah, that's nice. But who guys not read it? The, the second one, 1954, 53 I think was Marilyn, 54 was Jane Mansfield, was the second centerfold. That's worth thousands of dollars. But after that, there's too many of them out there. Go into eBay and look at 1954 Playboys. They're all over the place. They're bringing $5, $10 if you're lucky. I would say probably number two would be National Geographic. Number three would probably be Look or Life, one of those things. Uh, but the first edition of anything, they never made that many. If you have a first edition Mad Magazine with Alfred E. Newman, it's going to have value because they didn't make that many the first time around. And then once they sold out, they had a choice, reprint the first album or issue or come out with a second issue. Now, beware that their uh, Playboy number one has been reprinted. So, you know, don't go investing big money on a reprint. It's only the originals that are worth that kind of money. What about vital magazines? <laughs> probably not as much. Well, I, I remember selling some uh, probably five to ten years ago, and one from the 80s, a really ugly decade, decade as far as bridal count, and they were going for two million three hundred dollars A piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My, my advice, guys, if you're not sure what something is, go to eBay. <laughs> eBay completed prices. Uh, because don't go to a price guy. I, I never, I'm always speaking in libraries, and I don't want to insult the library. Who's the library in here? Okay, how big, of a, how big of a budget do they have for antique price guides? Zero. There's, there's nothing. So what you're getting out of the library is going to be outdated. I used to write the Wall Stein price guide for collector books. Uh, we did a, a whole number of books on this. Here's the dirty secret on price guides. The day a price guide comes out, the prices are at least five years old. And you say, how can that be true? Well, if a book comes out January 1st, 2020, it takes the typical publisher about a year to write a book or to publish a book. So that means the author had to get it until January 1st, 2019. It takes a typical author about a year to write a book. That means they started writing their book January 1st, 2018. Trust me, nobody writes a price guide without at least three, four, five years of prices or more. So during the 80s and 90s, it didn't matter. Because when the prices of antiques and collectibles were going up, 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 a lot of times by the time the price guide came out, your things were worth more than the books in. We're all happy. But now for the last 15, 20 years, the price of most antiques and collectibles has been coming down. So don't go to antique price guides for pricing material. Go to eBay or one of those pricing sources and find out what something is sold for within the last two weeks. That's all eBay gives you is what is something sold for in the last two weeks. So that's the best, way, best place to go see what your magazines are worth, but I would be surprised if you'd be getting $200 a piece on a bridal magazine today. But there's an exception to everything. Comic books. This slide should be out of there. Comic books are the one of the hottest things today. Five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, they weren't that hot. They sold the first edition Superman, DC1, 1937. $3 million. Oh, wow. Did you ever see the movie The Accountant? Yes. With Ben Affleck. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nobody notices this but me. <laughs> He's in the trailer. And at one point, he opens up a trailer door, drawer. Mm -hmm. And there's coins and stamps and cash and all these other things. Look in there. There's a Superman number one comic book he's got in that drawer. Worth several million dollars. I mean, it's, but it's, it's very subtle there. But uh, comic books, what I look for, first thing I look for is the price. Is a comic book 50, 75 cents, dollar each, not going to be worth much money. But if they're 12 cents, 10 cents or less, those are the early ones. 
Uh, also, you want to look for things like uh, superheroes. If the movie's been recently made by Hollywood, the comic book would correspondingly be, be worth money. If you go to, if you're looking for a price guide on comic books, there's something this thick. It's called the Overstreet Price Guide. That's the Bible. And you say, well, who's spending crazy money on, on comic books today? We're not. You ever heard of a guy named Mark Zuckerberg? Yeah. Yeah. Start uh, Facebook. He's worth $65 billion. Probably more than that today. How would you like to be that age and be able to take $5 billion, a billion, and buy whatever you want? Okay? And you still got $60 billion left in the bank. Well, there's a whole group of those what we call high net worth individuals. And people... They're buying whatever they want. And that's what's pushing the price of sports cards, baseball cards, uh, Super Bowl rings. Uh, I mean, all this stuff is going up, 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 because there are people who always want the best of the best. But if it's the middle market, not doing nearly as well. But comic books, be wary. Comic books can bring good money. Yes? Classic comics? No. <laughs> they don't bring much money. Classic comics were the ones we used to read. Uh, instead of reading the whole book for school, you read the classic comic book and you look at the pictures. They, they generally don't bring much money. Uh, but, you know, Superman, Batman. I mean, these kids have got it down where, you know, this is the first edition that Batman wore a green cape and a blue hat. So they, they, they put a premium price on that. But comic books, don't overlook them. <laughs> but Mike, Gail says to me, my, one of my clients, I'm going to sell my piano and my organ for pretty good money. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> she calls it up a week later. She says, you're right. Good news is, though, I got someone who's going to come and take it away. They're only going to, they're only going to charge me $300. <laughs> so I, I introduced her to FreeCycle. You guys ever heard of FreeCycle down here? Yeah. It's a takeoff on recycle. It's half more. F R E E C Y C L E dot com. You can't sell anything on there, but you could give it away. And so I told her, put these on free cycle. And sure enough, within a couple of days, I think the piano went to a church and the organ went to a, a senior day, daycare center or something like that. But free cycle means you don't have to pay someone to take it away. If they want it, they'll come and take it away for free. Then you take the small tax right off and you found something good. But there's not much work. Now, if you have a Steinway, if you have a Boston, if you have a Baby Grand, if you have a Morgan, they can still bring good money. But What's the problem with pianos? Moving them. You sent them to auction. But Mike, I paid $20,000 for this year's or My mother paid $20,000 for it. But it goes to auction. First of all, the auctioneer is going to sell it as is, where is. No guarantees. If you don't like it, you're not bringing it back. you got to get it home, which means you got to have a truck and three guys or four guys to lift it. You have to hope the soundboard isn't broken. And then you got to pay somebody to do it probably. So the way to sell a piano or something like that is not at auction. That's your last option. Generally, try and find someone that you privately uh, sue. What is it, Facebook Marketplace a lot of people yeah. use? Yeah. Yeah. Facebook Marketplace is free. Just put it up there. Take some pictures. Even put it on Craigslist. How many people here are worried about the Craigslist killer? <laughs> Good, don't worry about it. Just put it up there. There's a section on Craigslist for free. I mean, where you sell it. You, you, what you want to do is, if, if you're down like here, we, we are at home, small end local paper, $250 to appear for a day. Uh, but Facebook is free. Craigslist is free. Let go is free. There's many other places where you can put an ad for free with pictures. So take advantage of all that. All right, show of hands. Who's got a JFK assassinated newspaper somewhere in the house? I bet you more than that. <laughs> Most people do. Hand lands on the moon. Space shuttle Challenger blows open. World War II ends. Everybody kept these newspapers. They just don't bring a whole lot of money. Because there's more of them around the Kennedy assassinated. I mean, every paper had it. There's just not much value. I'm not saying throw them away. But you're better off giving them to the grandkids and let them throw them away in 20 years rather <laughs> than throwing them away now. <laughs> okay, limited edition prints, limited edition anything. Uh, I, <clears throat> Franklin Mint used to have unlimited editions, 50,000. Thomas Kincaid, limited edition print, 25,000, the same print. <laughs> Uh, so very few artists, I'm not saying none, have, have remained popular, 
But the whole purpose of a limited edition is that when there's an original, there's only one. So the artist says, well, maybe we'll create a limited edition, a limited number of these, so more people can accept it. And we'll make more money. <laughs> and so they try and, and, and limit it. Now, if you're dealing with etchings and gravings, you know, limited edition might be 5, 10, 15, 20, 50. But some of these things, if they're in thousands and thousands, you're not going to get your money back. So why could you like it? Not because you think it's going to blow up just because it's a limited edition. All right, here is the kiss of death. Uh, if you have something with a certificate of authenticity, you overpaid for it. Because that's why these people were just putting them in. They, the certificate of authenticity was designed to make you feel better about what you overpaid for what you bought. Uh, so even if you had that, if you had those collector plates with the original boxes, the original paper, the original certificate of authenticity, it's not going to add much value to it at all. I'm not letting ladies off the hook. Remember I told you all the dads that went out and collected baseball cards? Well, moms did the thing, same thing with the daughters. They said, well, we're going to go out and get Barbie doll. And we're not going to open it in the box. So we're going to put it in the closet. And every time a new Barbie doll came out, they would do that. They had 20 years ago, you're going to send you to college with this. Not going to happen. You know how many careers Barbie has had over the last 25 years? <laughs> Seriously, this is true. We, we, we researched it. Barbie has had 259 jobs <laughs> since she was introduced. Barbie, uh, Barbie the astronaut, Barbie uh, the marine, Barbie and Ken go to Bermuda to surf. I mean, whatever it is, Barbie had all these things. And so even if you have, other than the first edition, the first edition Barbie, uh, she's got the black and white bathing suit. That's been reproduced, so that doesn't mean anything. I believe she's got steel things through her legs, okay? But the first edition Barbie, original box, never played with, 10,000 bucks. How many girls never played with their Barbie dolls? Okay. How, many, how many kept the original box? So that first edition brings a lot of money because there weren't many made, but as the older you get, there's there's not that, they don't bring that much money. Mike, Mike. Mike. Yes? Going back to authenticity, how about authentic autograph major in baseball? You know what? Why don't we save that for the Q&As? Okay, because okay. that's more specific. I'd be happy to answer that for you. Let's save that for okay. the end. Have you ever gone to a restaurant? No. There we go. Okay. And they have pieces of art on the wall. $1,200, $900, okay? And you buy it, and you say, "Well, it must be worth it." Well, <laughs> that's that example I gave you. You know, you're when when you're looking at a fixed price, you have three choices: you pay the price, turn around, walk out the door, and negotiate. But whatever you pay for something has no bearing on what you're going to get for it. Keep that in mind. What you pay for something has absolutely no bearing on what you're going to get for it. Some things have gone up in value; most have gone down in value. Uh, and I, I kind of get in trouble with this thing because there's a lot of crafters. I'm sure there's some crafters here, but. In Doylestown, where I live, we have the uh, Doylestown Arts Festival. 300 dealers set up in tents, and they're beautiful artisans. They do their art, their photography, their uh, ceramics. All these things are beautiful, and they're pricey. They're hundreds of dollars, and they're worth every penny because that artist put their heart and soul as well as hours in the making it. But my point is just because you pay $300 at an art fair for something doesn't mean you're going to get $300 when you sell it. Value is only dependent upon how many people want it. Mm -hmm. So um, most art that you pay for lo from local artists, unless that artist has caught on and become a listed artist, probably not going to see uh, uh, your investment back. Coins and stamps. The fancier the packaging, the lower the value. Uh, remember when you were a kid, you read comic books. On the back page of the comic books, you buy a thousand one stamps for a dime. Well, that's what you get when you buy these fancy stamp packages on QVC or whatever it is. You're only going to charge $19.95 or $29.95. You're going to get a set, a stamp that's worth about a tenth of a penny. But you're paying for this beautiful sheet that's going to go into an expensive binder that they're going to sell you. And the binder tells you that this is the country of Guyana, and here's the population, and here's what the indigenous people grow, and here's all these wonderful things about this, and you're buying a stamp that's worth a tenth of a cent. None of those things are good. Uh, at least for, they're good to enjoy. They're not good investments. The Postal, postal Society, there's, a lot, there's one company that used to sell a lot of first-day covers. 
They're valueless. I mean, they're beautiful. They're nice. Hang out to them. But when you go to sell them at auction, they're not very popular at all. They don't bring much money. So fancier the packaging, usually the lower the value. Nobody wants your used bedding. <laughs> Would you go to an auction and buy someone's box springs or mattress and take it home and use it? No. You might go into your friend's house or a neighbor's house and say, wow, this is a nice clean house. I'll take this in a minute. But the auctions are like a big dark hole. You don't know where it's been. And you're afraid you're going to get it home and it's going to smell like cats or dogs or whatever. So no one wants that stuff. But what do you do with your used limbs? You throw it away? No, take it to the SPCA. SPCA is always looking for these kind of things for bedding, so recycle it. But just don't expect the auctioneer to want your used bedding, towels, and things like that. Crafts I kind of talked about already. You know, again, they're beautiful, they're worth every penny, but buy it because you like it. Don't buy crafts as an investment. <coughs> Same thing with bedding. But Mike, I just paid fifteen hundred dollars to have that sofa restored in a rear pulse from a few years ago. What do you mean it's worth fifty bucks? <laughs> it's the same thing. Nobody wants it um, from auction because how do you get it home? Most of us go to an auction with a car. So if we're gonna buy an upholstery, any kind of sofa, even some nice leather sofa, nice recliner, you always have to rent a truck to get it home. So who buys it? It's usually the dealers. And the dealers sit back until the price is so low, they can't say no. And then they've already got the truck to get it home. So beware, you're not going to get much for your bedding, your mattresses, your beds, upholstery, anything uh, at auction. Uh, let me get it back here. I don't want to miss that one. Well, Mike, I paid $1,500 for that roll top desk. What do you mean it's not worth anything today? What's wrong with roll top desks? That's part of it. They're technologically obsolete. They're nice. I mean, but you got the roll up top. Where do you put your computer? Well, Mike, I've got a laptop. Great. Where are you going to put your modem, your printer, uh, all these other accessories? Okay. Right now, we just want these L shaped work areas that are perfect for our stuff. So, because I am, because they're heavy and it takes four guys in a truck to move them, and because a lot of these things haven't been gluten. I, you know, 50 years, 100 years, they're not bringing that much money. So just be, be wary of that. All right. Nobody wants your non-flat screen TV. I can't, I still go into houses. And, and some of my clients are in the 80s and 90s, they saw that TV from the 60s. And they said, but it works fine. <coughs> I said, nobody's going to want it. You can't, you can't do anything with it. If it breaks, we're going to get the tubes. So I never thought of that. <laughs> All right, so your console TVs aren't worth anything. Neither are your non-flat screen TVs. Everybody wants flat screen today. Sue and I were in uh, Walmart the other day. 49-inch TV for $178. I mean, it's, uh, it's a 69-inch TV for $220. I think it's amazing how cheap they are today. So you're not going to get much on those. <laughs> What's wrong with entertainment centers? They're only good enough for a 33-inch TV or something like that. Now, this this is another one of my pet peeves. The younger generation thinks they invented repurposing. We invented repurposing. We would take something like that and turn it into a liquor cabinet, or would store sweaters or something in. Kids kids won't do that today, but. You know, your, your entertainment center is not going to bring much. Find a new home for it or make, make a new use for it. That, that would be my best advice there. Sue and I love country. We have country all over our house. But country is not as cool as it was 20 years ago. I can't tell you how often I go into a house and there's a wall filled with country collectibles. Like the mashers and the mallets and the knives and trivets and things like that that were hot. Every time Country Living Magazine came out, whatever they had in the cover, everybody in America went out and bought it. Brass beds. Brass beds were going for $15 a piece. Country Living put one on its front cover. Price went to $1,500. Now they're down to 15 bucks again. So uh, I, like, I like Country. Enjoy it. Unless it's the creme de la creme, probably not going to bring what you pay for it. I know. I'm looking around here. I know most of you guys have this, some of this stuff in the house, whether you admit it or not. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Put it by the curb with a sign that says free on. <laughs> <laughs> or take it to the, uh, the 
the metal recycling place. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst of all. This will be my, I think this is number 25, if I'm not mistaken. Brown is down. Now, have I ever been in any of your houses? Tonight I will have been in Trisha's house, but I've never been in her house yet. Okay. Let me predict that you either currently have, at one point in your life, you had a formal dining room. In that formal dining room, there's a table, probably an extension table. Surrounding that table are four, six, eight, or twelve chairs. On one side is a hutch. The hutch either has glass doors that you can see through or it's an open top. On the top is where you put your items of pride, things where you want your neighbors to see, your favorite Yadro, Sterling, Stuben, Hummels, things like that. Tucked underneath here, and on this side, you've got a side border buffet. That's where you keep that set of china that you haven't used in 40 years. <laughs> That's where you put your platters, your napkins, your napkin, your home, right? Every house in America is like that. So what's happening is, look at the nature. We're all getting older. We're all downsizing. We're buying places that probably don't have dining rooms, formal dining rooms. But the kids don't want stuff because they don't want formal dining rooms either. Kids are coming over. We're going to have a nice dinner. And we're going to clean those dishes, aren't we, Sue? Sue says, Mike, clean them. I said, I'm not cleaning them. You clean them. So what do we do? We bring out the plastic. <laughs> that's, what, that's become the style anymore. So that's kind of, kind of where we're at here. But the sad thing is brown is down. The kids don't want grandma's brown furniture. Uh, oak, maple, mahogany, I, 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 whatever. I was in a house one time in Doylestown, beautiful house, and the guy had good vintage oak. You know what I mean by turn of the century oak? In every room, it was beautiful. He paid good money for it. When I told him what I thought he would get for it at auction, he was a businessman. He went, it's okay, I'll donate. I can get more with the tax write of donating it than I will with the commission, you know, with, with what it sells for after commissions and, and moving expenses. So. Uh, just be aware, brown is generally down. If your kids like it, be thankful and let them have it. Uh, but it doesn't bring much. Okay, those are the 25 categories. Is there anybody who here who had none of them in their house? <laughs> All right, one person says that. All right, let's talk about what's hot. Because not everything's down. The key thing is today, it doesn't matter how much we liked it. It doesn't matter how much we pay for it. What does the younger gen or generation like? What do they want? And I think what I've got here is I'm going down, and this is just my opinion. I'm going to start at number six, work my way down to number one. Military is hot. We just sold a couple of World War II vintage bayonets on eBay. And they brought about 150 bucks a piece. That's, that's not bad money. Uh, we did a uh, Antiques Roadshow yesterday. Where were we yesterday? So, Ellington. Ellington. Uh, guy brought in a sword, a straight edge weapon, and he brought in a Winchester. I was surprised the library let him bring it in, but they did. It was a Winchester 94. Uh, and the straight edge weapon, I looked at it and said, I think it's a parade piece, but it would have done $150, $200. Military can do well. The further back you go, the better off you are. Uh, number five, auto related. You ever watch the, uh, the Pickers? What are those guys looking for? Porcelain signs, automotive stuff. That's what they look for. This stuff is hot. If you go to an antique show today, no problem finding a parking spot. It's harder. It's easier to find a parking spot at an antique show than in uh, the Island Beach Library here today. <laughs> uh, it's worse at a car show. Car shows are packed. Guys like their boy toys. Uh, around us, we have the Hershey and the uh, the Carlisle antique shows. They're huge, thousands of dealers of those things. I'm sure you have the same thing down here. Guys like their boy toys. Guys like their boy toys, ladies like their bling. Price of jewelry's been going up lately. Why? Price of gold and silver's been going up. The coronavirus is scaring people. And you're seeing the stock market go down a bit. And what usually happens when the stocks go down, precious metals go up. When the stocks go up, precious metals go down. Uh, so price of gold and jewelry, silver jewelry, uh, kind of corresponds to this. Uh, let me just throw out a theoretical here. You have an 18 karat gold necklace, solid gold necklace. And I put it on the scale, it weighs one ounce. 18 karat, one ounce. How much pure gold do you have? 
Nobody knows. So if you go and take it to a We Buy Gold store or a crooked jeweler, you're, you're dealing from a, a position of weakness because you don't know what you have. Gold, pure gold is 24 karat gold. 18 karat, 18 over 24, means it's 75% pure gold, 25% so base metal. If you have 14 karat gold, which is the most common gold you'll see, 14 over 24 means it's about 58.5%, the rest is base metal. The problem is, if you had a necklace that was pure gold, it's too malleable, it's too soft, it would bend. 10 karat is even less. If you have something that's sterling silver, what percentage of pure silver is sterling? Huh? You are close, but incorrect. 92.5%. If it's sterling, it has to be 92.5% silver. So people go and they, they take these things into the stores and they try and sell them, and they have no idea what they're doing. And so you've got to know what you're doing, because right now, a couple ounces of gold, or a couple ounces of silver, five, six, seven ounces of silver is worth 100 to 200 bucks. Five or six ounces of gold are worth almost 10,000, because gold's over uh, 1650, right? Give or take a little bit. One time I had I helped a client downsize. We filled up an entire van full of stuff. Brown furniture, pots, ceramics, things like that. Sold it at auction, brought about 1200 bucks. She had enough jewelry to fit on the bottom of a little bowl, 5500 bucks. Because gold is $1,600 an ounce. So keep that in mind, jewelry is hot. What about an antique um, silver plate that is tarnished? Save that. Okay. Save that to the end. Okay. I got a good answer for that. High end art market. Rich people <laughs> always have money. You live here, you got to be rich. <laughs> Pennsylvania, like us, we're not rich. But seriously, the high end market uh, is going crazy. Modern art is doing better than uh, old masters' art. But somebody just paid last year, two years ago, four hundred and fifty million dollars for one piece of art. Somebody just paid 80 million dollars for two pieces of art, but you know who the guy was? You ever hear a guy named Jeff Bezos? I mean, the high end market, the ultra high net worth individuals have the money. So they're fighting with each other over the value of some of these things. So the high end art market is good. If it's Wallace Nunning, like what I specialized in, dead. People don't have it. Sorry, Trish. Okay. Number two, gold and silver coins can do very well. A good gold coin, gold coins like a, an eagle is $10, a double eagle is $20, uh, then you got half eagles, quarter eagles, and the bigger they are, the more gold is in them. They grade coins today. They grade comic books. They grade stamps. You know what grading is? Grading is where they'll take a coin and they'll encapsulate it. And there's professional grading services that do this. And so they may take this, uh, an 1888 uh, $20 gold coin. They encapsulate. They're not going to put a value on it. They just say that, in our opinion, this coin is authentic. And on a scale of 1 to 10, it's graded 9.4. Okay, coins are different grading, but it's, that's close to what I'm talking about. And so that way, when you go to sell it on eBay, it's not your word saying it's it's a 10, not 9.4 on a scale of 1 to 10. It's the grading service. People can bid with confidence like that. They're now grading video games. They just sold a video game for $100,000. What do we care about video games for? They were our kids and our grandkids. Mm -hmm. Well, our kids are now making more money than we are. They're the ones who are investing into things that they grew up with during their youth. So don't throw the, don't donate those video games. Call me. <laughs> All right. Um, what do you think is the hottest thing? And I'm speaking for Pennsylvania, but I'll bet you this is close to being true down here. What do you think is the hottest thing in auction? You go to a firearms auction, you can't find a parking spot. Uh, it's got to be done legally, FFL, Federal Firearms License Regulations. Uh, handguns are different than rifles, antiques are different than modern, there's certain kinds of rules. But uh, handguns are hot, uh, firearms are hot. And uh, fortunately, if you're going to use an auction for firearms or anything else in Florida, you're in a good state. Florida has a good auctioneer law, it's like Pennsylvania. Uh, people don't understand that auctioneers are fiduciaries. We handle people's money. If you are a financial advisor, your hands are hamstrung. They're tied behind your back when you got to deal with the government. Well, certain states are look at auctioneers differently. Pennsylvania has a very strong auction licensing law. In order to become an auctioneer and handle other people's money in Pennsylvania, you have to serve a two-year apprenticeship under an auctioneer or go to a licensed auction school. You have to be licensed and bonded by the state. 
And if you have a problem with an auctioneer, you're entitled to be heard before the State Board of Auctioneers. That's good. That's for your protection. Across the river from us in New Jersey, there's no state auction licensing law. In theory, somebody could come out of Trenton State Prison or Railway State Prison today and handle your money tomorrow. So fortunately, Florida and Pennsylvania are very similar. You've got a good, good auction your law, licensing law here. Okay, so far we've covered 25 categories. You'll probably dis be disappointed. Were you disappointed? No. Yeah. Yeah. Were you happy with the hot things? No, nobody likes the firearms thing. All right, let's talk about 25 things you can throw away the minute you get home. <laughs> and then I'll open it up to questions and answers. Fair enough? Yeah. All right. 25 things you can throw away the minute you get home. Magazines from the last 10 years. I, I go into houses and people have all these magazines. Don't throw away early Playboys. Don't throw away the early magazines. But for some of these magazines from the last 20 maybe the 1980 bridal magazines are worth money. Hang on to them until you find out. But most of these magazines you can just get rid of. All right. Old receipts you don't need. Any accountants here? Four more accounts? Yeah, I think they tell you you need to keep your tax records for three years, five years, seven years, just different long. After that, throw them away. I've got tax records from 20 years ago. Don't ask me why, just because they're in the crawl space and I can't get at them. But you, you get rid of that stuff and then you get home. Burn it, shred it, whatever you got to do with it. Bills, more than a year old. If you haven't paid the bill and they haven't come after you, you're probably okay. Just you can throw those kind of pull those bills away. Bank statements. You no longer need. Same thing. You know, just get rid of them. Don't throw them in the trash. Burning them in the fireplace is not good because it generates too much heat, so shred them one way or another. <laughs> keys without locks, locks and lock keys. Show hands. Who has a junk drawer in their house? That's where you usually put these things, hoping we match them up and we never do. <laughs> Surplus <laughs> My rule of thumb is nobody needs more than a thousand. <laughs> Containers of partially used cosmetics. If you forget what it was used for, let it go. Time to throw it away. Medicines for conditions you no longer have. Unless they're narcotics, then be real careful with those maybe. Socks without mates. We've all got them, and then when you move and they move the, the, the washing machine dryer, that's when you find all the mates in the bathroom. Same thing with gloves. Well, you don't need gloves down here. Back home, we need gloves usually in the wintertime. Single costume earrings. Now, what I'm saying here is be careful, okay? If it's a single costume earring, it's probably not going to do you much good. But don't throw away precious metals. Sterling, gold, 14 karat, 18 karat. It's all going to be marked. Make sure you don't throw that away because you could always scrap it and turn it into some kind of cash. Earrings don't weigh a lot, but a nice pair of earrings could bring at least $50, $75 or more in gold. Stale spices. My rule of thumb is if you can't see it, the front ones you're going to use is the ones in the back, you can probably throw those away when you get home. All right. Overused pots and pans. I go into houses where people, they, want, they really, they mean good, they want to help. And they say, well, Mike, can't we donate these? And they're showing me Tupperware can, uh, containers with orange spaghetti stains. Don't <laughs> oh, no. those things. Throw them away. <laughs> Dishes, cups, things like that. You know, when you're going to donate, they don't want a single glass. If you go to one of Goodwill or one of these stores, they want at least sets of four, sets of six. Throw them away if they're no good there. If they're incomplete, throw them away. Nobody wants the cups and saucers if they're good today. Grandma collected uh, tea cups and saucers. Fine bone china, English bone china. I got five boxes of stuff. I can't sell. The auctioneers don't want it. Kids don't want it. They're dust collectors. So 
Uh, especially if you, if you got a, one with a broken handle, don't bother glue the handle back on. <laughs> it does, it's not worth it. <laughs> Plastic garden pots. <laughs> now, of all the things, this is the only thing I point my wife. To, I blame my wife for this. She has about 50 garden pots there. I'm, I'm responsible for everything else. But how many garden pots do you need? If you need them, use them. If not, let them go. Paperback books without covers. What do you do with those? Don't need them. Don't need them. Other people will read them. There's no value. The auctioneer doesn't want them. You want to spend a day selling nickel books at a garage sale? I mean, seriously. But there's people who will read them. So put them out in front. I know a lot of people around the world now have these professionally made uh, book things, book libraries. We take a book, help yourself, leave a book for somebody else. That's cool. Don't throw them away, but give them away. Don't, don't, mm -hmm. unless you want to work making a nickel, that's a few. <laughs> when I was in school in the 60s, they always changed textbooks. So we couldn't even sell them to the next class because they changed them every year. Uh, so if you got your textbooks, let them go. If you're still sitting on your kids, your grandkids' textbooks, give them an opportunity to come pick them up. And if they don't pick them up within whatever you pick, let them go. What's that? Log books. Those I go into a lot of houses where they've got a wall filled with really old books and they're pretty and they're matching sets. Six, eight, twelve. Looks good. Now say them, when's the last time you read them? Well, I never read them. But they look good. So they're not gonna bring much auction because they're more decorative than reading. Most people you how many show hands? Who reads from Kindle? I mean, yeah, it's, I like my kid. I, I would prefer to buy a cheaper book or go to the library, okay. but it's easier because as my eyes get worse, I just increase it one type size and I can read better. Right. All right. Why are those things? Again, don't throw them away. <laughs> to, to the to the laundry that you use them, give them to them. But uh, they're not. There's no value there. Oh God, I'm almost done. Again, we talk about these kind of things. So when I say soil, I mean just not usual. Donate them to, to the SPCA or, or pet stores or something like that. They're usually happy to re receive them. We've already talked about that. Outdated technology. Now, I just finished a column. I read a column called the What's It Worth Antique Minutes. It's about five or six trade papers around the country. And we're talking about uh, the renewal of vinyl records. And what I say is that car styles never come back. Clothing styles hardly ever come back. I say in there that uh, technology never comes back. But vinyl's coming back. I mean, we thought vinyl was dead 20 years ago. This year, I think for the first time since 1986, vinyl records are going to outsell CDs. Because it's just technology is coming back. Don't ask me why. Show of hands. How many have your college age record player still somewhere at home? Nobody. My kids have gone out and they bought vinyl. I said, can you tell the difference? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, partially full of paint cans. Chances are, if they're three years old, even if they've got full of paint, they're not going to make some paint they're going to try and cover up. So just let them go. Oh, man, I'm not even going to get into this because we're not here long enough. But uh, this is basically what we do. We, we help people deal with their stuff. Back home. We charge $195 to go out to a house and we do two things. We go throughout the entire house, we talk value, we talk options. Um, we do a lot of appraisals, written appraisals for probate and inheritance tax, for divorces, for non cash general contributions. This is what I do, guys. I get paid to look at other people's treasures. I got the best job in the world. <laughs> With that said, I'm open to any questions. You had the first question in the back. The authenticity of uh, MLB autograph <laughs> Who signed it? Let's say Derek Jeter. Can you prove it? No. <laughs> yeah, no I'm, not, I'm not questioning you. The, the FBI has estimated that upwards of 70% of sports autographs are faked. But what if they have a certificate of authenticity? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question, and the answer is the certificate of authenticity means nothing. But what they will do with that baseball is they will send it out to one of the baseball grading services who will then authenticate it, encapsulate it so no human hand will touch it again, and then attached to that will be the certificate of authenticity that says we 
GPS grading service have guaranteed this ball to be authentic and we graded 8.1 on a scale of one to 10. That's how you add value to, to sports equipment like that. Uh, other than that, you can put it on eBay and it's your word or my word that it's right and put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Are you gonna pay top dollar unless you're 100% sure? So that's why they're grading coins, autographs, sports memorabilia, all that other stuff. Uh, and so you gotta make a dollar and cents decision. Um, if it's their Jeter's rookie glove, sure, that's worth paying $35 or $50 for it to have it graded. But if it's a $25 card, do you wanna pay $35 to have it graded? Probably not, so it's, it's, it's a fine line, but the grading has really come a long way, and there's differences of opinions on that, but that's how I would answer that question. All depends on who it is, but you gotta be able to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Very tarnished um, platter of silver. Sterling silver or silver plate? Sterling silver. You sure? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> how did I tell? On the underside, if it's sterling, it's going to say probably sterling, but sterling. Okay. Or it will say 925 or 925 slash 1000, which talks 99% Most platters are plate. You can't give silver plate away today. Nobody wants to polish it. Sterling silver. I love sterling, man. I love it. You give me a Yagro figurine that's this high and I drop it and shatters, what's it worth? Zero. I take that platter, if it's sterling, drive over with a steamroller, I still have the silver value. So sterling silver still has value. Not as people use it as they used to, but it's worth far more because of the intrinsic silver value. So I look for the numbers on the back. You, more likely it'll say sterling. Okay. If it doesn't say sterling, 95%, it's not. It'll be silver plate. If it says plate, it's not. Now, yesterday when we finished our Antiques Roadshow at the library, we had some silver jewelry that we weren't sure what it was and some gold. So I told people right afterwards, we tested it. I, have, I always carry a stone with me and some acids, and we could test it. And one of the pieces tested a 14 karat gold. The silver piece did not. Just because it's marked silver doesn't mean it's real. If you have something that's marked alpaca silver, German silver, uh, Sheffield silver, those are not silver. Those are silver plates. Coin silver is generally 90%. Now, different countries used different standards. Part of Mexico used 95% sterling. Part of it was 90. Scandinavia was 83.5. So if you see something marked 835, there's a good chance it's silver. Uh, coins were 90% silver. So back in the old days, what they would do is they would take the coins, melt them into forks. And they would be 90% silver because the coins were 90% silver and they would be marked coin. Now, when they needed money, they would take the silverware, melt that down, and melt it back into coins. <laughs> I mean, we're talking years, you were talking a couple hundred years ago they did that. Yes? I have kind of an interesting thing. My dad got a first aid issue for the three astronauts. Um, he took a Norman Rockwell. Which, which astronauts? John Glenn? Armstrong, Clinton? the Virgin Okay. And uh, the, the, there were three of them. Okay. Armstrong's the only one that's still alive. He created an envelope with a first day issue on it, put a Norman Rockwell of the three uh, of the three astronauts on the envelope. He got Norman Rockwell's signature. He got two of the uh, two of the ones that had passed on astronauts, but Armstrong is the only one. I was offered five hundred dollars for it by a coin a CF dealer. Should I have taken it, or should I wait till the last one is? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Do you want to go to Disneyland this week, or uh, wait? <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, it, there's no right or wrong time. You sell when you feel like you're ready to. Yeah. You know, the problem with that is I don't doubt one word that you said. I know that there's no proof. But you have to have the proof, or you have to have it authenticated. So it might be worth paying a couple hundred dollars to have some uh, autograph authenticator do what he has to do to authenticate it, and that way you're set to go. They, they can encapsulate it so they can't touch it. Because yeah, yeah, those autographs mean a lot. Uh, and the farther out they go, the more valuable they're gonna become. Anybody here work for the government? Good, I'll tell you this story. <laughs> our brilliant government, uh, close your ears. 
as only our government can, they had a an auction a while ago. They sold a thousand tapes, video VHS tapes, from uh, Neil Armstrong's Walk on the Moon. And guess what was in those tapes? The first tapes of man walking on the moon shot up there. They sold them. They brought two hundred fifty-four dollars that auction. The whole thing, all thousand tapes. The guy, once he realized what he had, he sold the three best tapes, a quarter million dollars. Wow. But he had to have them authenticated. They were so the key. I keep saying this over and over again, but uh, verification, authentication, is the way to go. If you say something that Jackie Kennedy sat in, great story. Can you prove it? That's going to be the next thing. Yes, sir. Lionel Train. 1930. You have the original boxes. Have you oiled them within the last 30 years? Last 20 years? Yeah, I do. They're my dad. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem with Lionel trains. When I was a kid in the 50s, every house on the street at Christmas time had a Christmas tree. Everyone had a train set that went around underneath it. And then some dads took that a step further and they had a board down in the basement that they kept going all year round. Uh, <laughs> When was the last time you had them running? Oh, no, that's a long time. When I was a kid. So why are you oiling them if you're not running? Uh, no, no, it doesn't matter. That's, that doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, but my, my point is, yes, there are guys who buy trains. We would fit right in with that age group. The kids don't want trains. Now, there's a guy up near us. His name is Ted Maurer. He's an auctioneer in Pennsylvania. He's probably the number one train auctioneer in the country that I'm aware of. So if I have trains, that's where I would sell my trains. I've steered clients to him because he's going to sell his tra your trains in front of a train-oriented audience. Uh, you'll get more for your trains at a train auction than you would at a doll auction. You get more for your dolls at a doll auction than at a train auction. So you have to find the right auctioneer. But with that said, there are fewer and fewer and fewer people seemingly collecting trains each year as we go as we go along. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you suggest a place? Excuse me. Am I doing okay timelines? We're, um, we're, our time is out, but we'll take Last one. question. A few more questions. Um, can you suggest a company or some place where you can take, for example, if you have single sterling silver earrings, you've got a bunch of silver that you want to sell. You know, I, I never know where there's a reputable place to do that. If you're talking silver, I can answer that. Yeah. All right, I'll stay and answer questions, but it sounds like we've run out of time, right? Now, here's what I want you to do, guys. Did you have fun? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. On your way out, on your way out, you tell the friends in the library to bring Sue and I back next year. We'll do an antiques road show where everybody brings one thing and we'll praise it right here. Thanks for coming out. I'd be happy to answer any questions.